And a very warm welcome to the LBC Book Club. Uh, joining me on the Book Club this evening are two excellent authors. David Baddiel will need very little introduction to many, well, most of you, I would have thought. Um, he's written a, a, a stonkingly thick novel here. How many pages is it? God, it's... Ian, it's, that's the second time you've referred I know, to the well, it size is, it's, of the novel. It's, it, well, I mean, runs a book club, I would have thought I'd only be pleased size, you know, size to really get his teeth into Size something. counts, David, as yeah. you well oh, know, God, know that. from your previous um, incarnations. <laughs> Four hundred to get, get the program off to a good start like yeah. that. Hey, four hundred and twelve pages, so it's very good value for mine. It's called "The Death of Eli Gold." Um, also with me is Jessica Francis Kane, who's got a slightly thinner slimmer. volume yes. here, slimmer. Yes. Yeah, two hundred and thirty-eight pages. <laughs> um, it, it's called "The Report," which I have to say is not the snappiest title I've ever seen. It's not for a novel. No, but there's a very good reason for it to be called that. Go on. Well, it's it's um it's about a report being written. It, uh, it's it really tries to examine what it is we expect from public reports after a tragedy, and and it is about the magistrate, the ma the man asked to investigate a particular tragedy that happened in London during the war, and it is about the report he writes and the way he writes it. So my publisher and I talked and talked about whether we should call it something more exciting, but kept coming back to something just simple and to the point. Uh, what, what we would call a Ron Seal title, which you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. When I I say that. A Ron Seal was a product. Am I allowed to mention You it? are. Go on. It's a product. That I think it's for painting fences. Um, but it, it says, it had this advert which said it does exactly what it says on the tin, which presumably there was something on the tin that said it Very paints good. fences. <laughs> um, and the report, what Ian is saying, is it, your book is about a report, so therefore it's so like therefore a Ron it Seal. Is called, yeah. It's not the best review you'll ever get. <laughs> it's a Ron Seal book. <laughs> you put that but, so much better than I would have done. Can I just say that? Thank yeah. you for the But talking about titles actually mm. the title of mine is interesting from that point of view in that um i got a uh, thankfully very nice review in the times the other day and they said with this title you might think the book is about dying or about um jews because eli gold sounds like a very mm. jewish name and uh, but in fact it's about neither of those things really it's about great men and it's interesting it's an interesting quandary at one point i thought about uh, changing Eli Gold's name from that point of view, because my last novel was called The Secret Purpose, it was actually also set during the war, it was about the internment of Jewish German refugees on the Isle of Man during the Second World War. And one day I was in Waterstones and I saw it in what they call the Jewish interest section, and I thought, I'm smuggling <laughs> this out and putting it into the recommended section. You did away. a Jeffrey Archer then, <laughs> which is yeah. what he does. Does he actually do he, that? He rearranges the shelves in every yeah. bookshop he goes no, into. No, I was too frightened being seen to do it, but I did think, do, do I want this book to be in the Jewish interest section? Because I don't want to write a book that non-Jews think is not for them. You know, mm. I kind of think that's a weird ghettoization of literature. So with this book, I thought about, and the book really, you know, as it happens, Eli Gold himself is half Jewish and half Catholic, and I only made him ethnic in that way because the book is about uh, one of those authors, the sort of Norman Mailer, Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, but also yeah. John Updike style characters, all kind of rolled into one. That who are all your literary heroes? They're my literary heroes, but also they dominated a certain type of cultural scene in America in literature in the, in the part of the last century, and are all are all dying or have been dying for quite a, a while and so the book is about the passing of that kind of man and I felt that most of those men had some kind of ethnic spin on them so that's why I kept it. Now, you two have some interesting connections, really, don't you? Because I always like to have that with the authors that I get in here. <laughs> Jessica, you're from New York. You've written a book about London. Set in London, yes. Uh, David, you're from London, but were born in New York right. and have written, and your plot is, well, mostly based in, in it New is, York. It is, mostly based in Mount Sinai Hospital in uh, New York. Which so is how spooky is that? Side. Yes, it's it is odd. Weird. We just discovered that, yeah. waiting to come on the show. But Jessica also lived in London. You lived in London for three I years? I did. I lived in London for three years, um, about ten years ago, and loved it. Uh, just loved it. And that was when I learned of the accident that the novel. Well, well let's around. start. Let's start on that and and uh, tell people a little bit about the book. How does an American come to be writing about? A, a terrible disaster that happened in a London underground station in 1943. It seems very unlikely, it doesn't does, it? It does, doesn't it? I know, yes. Uh, well, as I said, I was living here. I was working on another book at the time that was going nowhere fast, and um, and I, I used to spend my afternoons in the British Library. And one afternoon I left my desk and wandered into the bookshop where there was an event in progress. And uh, a man was speaking about a new series of books called Uncovered Editions, which were historical government reports. That would have been Tim Coates. Interest. Um, is that right? Who I publish. Oh, really? My day job is a publisher. So. Oh, well, then that's so it, I, then. God, all these yes. so, speaking coincidences <laughs> here. Well, so these, right, and so he, th this was, these were from the archives, uh, and they were published in, a, in sort of sweet little pamphlets, and the one that he was speaking about when I walked in was the tragedy of Bethnal Green. And, 
And he, he spoke very compellingly about the time and the place, mm. the East End during the war, um, the, the mysteriousness of the accident, that, that 173 people were killed, mostly women and children, um, on a night when, the worst fact of all, there, there was not a raid. There were no bombs. And so I was very compelled. I, I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was amazing that it was the largest civilian accident of the war but was not well known. And I took notes and thought it might be a, a backdrop for a story someday, but Really, it wasn't until a year later when I uh, began to think that it might be something I'd handle as a novel, and and that was after the events of 9-11. But you see, that's even more peculiar, to think of this book as a novel. And it seems to be a growing genre now of writing novels about events that actually happened. Michael Dobbs wrote a fantastic trilogy about Churchill in the Second World War a few years ago, and it sort of... I mean, that was combining fiction and fact. It's sort of faction, I suppose, it became known as. How how closely have you stayed to the the real-life events here? Fairly close. I I changed a few key things, but really I I wanted to honour the accident. I wanted to make sure that I I paid attention to to that. I mean, there are survivors who are still alive, and so I made sure I had a historical framework that was solid on which I could build a story. And and, um, I don't know. I believe in this as a premise. You know, Virginia Woolf in in A Room of One's Own, there's a a great quotation I like, which is um, she said that fiction must stick to the facts. But the truer the facts, the better the fiction. That's, and, that's um, very deep. I'm trying to understand <laughs> that as we. And talk. so here we have some amazing true facts about a, a, a disaster during the war in a in a population that was particularly hard hit and 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 had behaved so nobly, had mm. been asked to make terrible sacrifices during the war, did so nobly, and then this this disaster befalls them, and and the government doesn't really respond very very so well. So Jessica, to them. can I can I just ask something? something? Yeah. So this was a, a tragedy that happened, and the reasons for it were not understood at the time. So it wasn't. <laughs> a bomb that's right it was not a bomb okay um it, it was blamed on panic but then the east end was really upset about that because well, because this was 1943 ex- just explain exactly how it came to happen what what happened on that night yes all right so so it was march 3rd of 1943 so it was the midpoint of the wars mm. and this shelter had been used since nearly the beginning of the war so right. there was no se- and it, had, and it, it was effectively after- a new tube station it had been built in the 1930s it was, hadn't actually got gone into that's operation right. yet that's but right. it was used as a shelter and also it was, the, the blitz would have been over so that's right the worst of the blitz sustained was over. bombing was over exactly there were still raids but it yeah. was more of a tit for tat sort of thing between london and berlin they were yeah. not nightly anymore yeah. um and so and so th- there was just no reason for the crowd to have panicked on this particular night so um but there were several factors involved. So on March 1st, uh, there had been a very bad bombing of Berlin, and there was a sense in the area that there was going to be a retaliatory raid, and they right. were and they were braced for that. Yeah. Um, there was they knew there was the possibility of a new anti aircraft gun being used. They'd been told the area had been told that if it were used, they would be there would be a test, there would be a warning. Because what's so amazing is the East End knew the sound of the bombs. They could just tell from the sound whether it was an oil bomb, an incendiary bomb, a high explosive, whatever, whatever kind of bomb it was. They knew from the sound. Right. So the new sound, the sound of a new anti-aircraft gun, if, if it went off without a test, would have spooked them. And there's right. this, um, I believe it is there's a, there's a sense that that was a contributory cause as well. Um, there was only one entrance to this enormous shelter. It it, it could hold six thousand people, and there right. was one. Six thousand. That's right. right. Um, it was huge. Um, the, you know, they the tunnels were filled with bunks. I mean, it was you know, it was it was it was large. Uh, it was the largest deep shelter in the area. So it it pe- drew people from all over. One one entrance, one staircase down, and so you know, it was eight. 17 at night the the alert went off um at the it was blackout so so people were very concerned about the amount of light on this on the single staircase into the shelter how much light was not much light was allowed to be on it because they were afraid you'd see it from the street and and there was a rush there was just sort of a rush to the to the entrance and 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 it is known that someone tripped and fell that um and Within minutes, there was a crush across the staircase, and 173 people died of asphyxiation. There was only a single broken bone. So presumably your novel is partly about uh, finding out the actual truth of that night, so we don't want to give that away completely. But but is that the structure? No one quite knows what happened. That's right. Because part of your novel is set in 1973 as well. Yes, that's right. So, I mean... 
I, th- I think in a way the novel is about how impossible it is to tell completely the story of a tragedy. Yeah. It's, it's really about the magistrate's work trying to sort out all the causes, mm. trying to avoid blame, understanding that at this time of the war to blame any one entity was going to be devastating. So he, he tries very hard to avoid that. And, and so then there is this contemporary storyline set in 30 years later when a young filmmaker is, is preparing a documentary as a retrospective. And so the tables, tables are turned on the magistrate. Mm. He's done the questioning in 1943 and now he's being questioned. And I, I, I wanted the book to show sort of the immediacy of the, of the tragedy as well as the reflection that only comes with time and how our perception of blame changes over time. Yeah. So those are the ideas well, well, slightly I'm going to t- I'm going to bring up my book now because oh, I'm, nice. well, feel, I'm, feel I'm free I'm only, I'm not, not in a purely gratuitous <laughs> way I feel my role here is superfluous sorry <laughs> but, but not, carry on but only because that change of perception over time in terms of some moral perception is slightly what my book is about in a way yes. as well because my book is re- sort of really about the way that the license that those great men had to behave very very badly kind of towards their specifically their, their women but also I guess their children as well and the damage that they did uh, was at the time I feel kind of just granted and taken for granted that this was a license they had because they were genius or genii or whatever you would call them and that that has sort of changed now that now we don't really grant that license to, to great men in fact the mm. idea of the great man may not exist anymore in anything like the same way um, and so that um, particularly what I have I have four characters in the book that are sort of surround Eli Gold's deathbed crucially um, the first is his daughter he's like 90 well let's come on to the character in a second okay so uh, we do have to go to the travel it's okay. uh, quarter past nine Let's go to the travel <laughs> and here's alan joyce thank you ian an update on the tubes now the bakerloo line sus- now you're listening to the lbc book club with me ian dale and also jessica francis kane who's written a book called the report it's it's a novel actually as i said it's a slightly odd title for a novel but it's about the bethnal green tube disaster in 1943 and david Badil is here too he's written a, a book called the death of eli gold that's a novel as well so it's the first time we've had two novelists on on the program um oh. david we, just before we um broke for the travel we were talking about the characters mm. In your book now, for for any novelist, defining the characters, I guess, is probably the most crucial part of the book, apart from deciding what the plot is. Um, yeah. The very distinctive characters here, very contrasting characters, particularly yeah. Eli Gold himself, and then his son Harvey, yeah. who is almost, I mean, seems to me to be trying to live up to his father's reputation. Yeah, to, to some but extent. All kind of the opposite in, in yeah. many ways. Well, I mean, one of the things about um, those men who Eli Gold is based on, and actually Eli Gold is both the central character of this novel and also kind of not there at mm. some level because he's in a coma yeah. throughout the book. And, uh, and, and you know, they created around them, obviously, these extended and broken families. Uh, Saul Bellow had five wives, uh, Norman Mailer had seven wives, um, and Eli has five wives. And uh, that means he has a number of children, some of whom have not turned up to see him die because they're still furious with him for the way that he left their particular mother or whatever. But the ones who have turned up, there is a young girl uh, called Colette who's nine, um, who's, uh, she might even be eight, I can't remember, she might age during the novel. Eight. Uh, she's eight. <laughs> um, thanks very much. It's your uh, daughter, it's your daughter just, that's she's nine. She's just turned nine, actually, just now. <laughs> um, and uh, she, um, uh, she was actually the starting point for the novel insofar as when Saul Bellow died. Eli Gold is not Saul Bellow, he's a, very much a composite of a number of different types of men but when Saul Bellow died I remember reading a lot of eulogies about him obviously and I noticed that all of them said at the end of it that at his deathbed were his wife and daughter and I just thought how interesting it is that that doesn't comply with an image he might have an old man mm. at his deathbed with you know his 60 year old daughter it is in fact his 39 or whatever year old wife and his 8 year old daughter and then I thought what is that like for her and that seemed to fit into for me to a whole literary tradition of like what Maisie knew or Little Nell of young girls being placed into a situation where uh, information is coming at them that is not quite right for them at that age and so I thought I'll try and write that character and then I didn't want to write a novel entirely from the point of view of a child so I also create yeah this, this sort of 42 year old 44 in fact 44 uh, year old very screwed up son uh, who's totally not got any of his dad's talent this, mm. is, from his, this is from his third wife uh, who's a celebrity ghostwriter and who represents the sort of other side of fame the sort of you know wrong side of fame compared to Eli's very very high class fame his son writes uh, ghost writers for people who are in Sex and the City and that kind of thing mm. and is trying has also been brought it's up by market. his market nothing wrong with no, it no nothing wrong with it no no and uh, in fact you know the book is very much about how 
that you know these types of greatness mm. need to be realigned or what is good and what is bad but um you know uh, he is also someone who grew up with his mother uh, who hates eli and who became an arch feminist eli is very much perceived as a misogynist and uh, and so he's schooled as a new man in the way that many of us were in the 80s very much like even kind of in the 80s kind of to fancy a woman was thought of you thought well there might be something wrong with that so he's well, in I his certainly did in, in, in his for, for different reasons yeah, right yeah <laughs> but in his bones uh, eli uh, harvey he feels like you know he might be doing the wrong thing all the time and then he can feel to as his dad starts to die he can feel some of the return of sort of what his dad his dad's urges happen so he's torn apart by that then there's uh, violet who is eli's first wife who's watching the whole thing on tv from a care home in london and then there's this rather shadowy fourth character who's a fundamentalist mormon who and this is just hold on to this information eli's fourth wife died in a suicide pact from which eli didn't die and the mormon is her brother who is coming from utah in order to kill eli in revenge uh, before he dies of natural causes and in a way what he represents the mormon is another type of american masculinity eli is the kind of sophisticated new york mm. urban macho male and this is the kind of cowboy Cormac mm. mccarthy but also interestingly with many wives because he's polygamous yeah so it's all those people all coming together and all clashing on this dead at uh, this deathbed scene. I can see a film in it. Well, I <laughs> hope so. I do hope so. Um, one, there was a less than friendly review in the Guardian, and and the guy that wrote it, Stephen Paul, he says it's odd for a novelist to be imagining the death of another novelist who is still alive, or at least to be doing so publicly. Mm. Yeah, well, that's because uh, Stephen Paul, God bless him. Uh, thought that uh, Eli is entirely based on Philip Roth, mm. which he isn't. Um, I mean, Philip Roth turns up um, at Eli's bedside because various Bill Clinton also turns up at Eli's bedside because that's what happens when great men die is other great men come and see them passing. Um, and it would indeed be odd if Eli was entirely based on Philip Roth for mm. Philip Roth to turn up, but he's not. <laughs> so I can only uh, apologise for Stephen Paul's see, mistake. It, David's book has more actual <laughs> historical characters in it than my book does, even yeah. though mine's based on a historical event. Mm. Isn't that uh, odd? No, that is yeah, bizarre. That is odd. Yes. That is weird. Yeah. <laughs> when you uh, map out, or maybe you don't map out a plot, I mean, do, do you have in your own mind, when you start writing the book, exactly what's going to happen? Or, I mean, Anne Widdicombe once said to me, um, when she's writing her novels, that there's always a point in the, when she's writing, that one of the characters takes her by surprise. Right. Does that happen to you? Well, it certainly happened to Anne Widdicombe on Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> I saw her being taken by surprise many times, and she took me by surprise. But, uh, no, uh, uh, well, I understand what... <laughs> What Anne means, in fact, which is something I never thought I'd say. Um, <laughs> I I don't at all write with a fixed uh, uh, idea of what's going to happen. I, I write with a central idea. In this case, it was uh, the death of a great man and his family turning up to see it. Um, but my first novel, for example, is about a man who's in love with his wife, uh, uh, in love with his brother's wife, and then starts to d to have a relationship with her sister. And I just had that idea, and then I wrote kind of improvising from that. Mm. But what I find is, and I don't know if you find this at all, Jessica, is that uh, after you've been sort of improvising for a bit, a structure does emerge from the fog, and then you go back and rewrite based on that structure that's emerging. I agree completely. It, it, it's the same for me. I, I have an idea, and I I have a general direction I'm trying to head in, but uh, but they, but a character does surprise me usually, and and it is the rewriting. It's 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 after you have a full draft, you've gotten to the end, and then you and then then you actually have a better sense of what it is you've done and want to do and it's the rewriting when the when the actual um, I agree. story really emerges i also think that in terms of what we've been talking about a bit with sort of faction and fiction and whatever is that sometimes you might base a character on someone you sort of vaguely know or whatever uh but then within about sort of 10 pages of fictionalizing them they have become someone else and so when people start to say oh i think that character's based on me or whatever i always think well absolutely not by the time i've got into writing the character it's I, yes I, I didn't detect frank skinner in the book at all you didn't uh, well then you missed a trick there based, the character's based on norman mailer philip roth and frank skinner <laughs> 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 um, wh when you were writing the eight-year-old, yeah. I mean, how are you, you write as the eight-year-old, yeah. and that must be that's an incredibly difficult thing to pull off. And I think I, mean, I have to admit, I'm only halfway through the book, but from what I've read so far, you, you do pull it off. I would find that incredibly difficult. Was that the most difficult character to write? Um, no, actually, uh, no. Actually, I was. It was with great relief. Your inner eight-year-old. Uh, well, yeah, first I think. Well, I do actually believe in as a comedian. One thing that you have to continue to be in touch with is your, as it were, inner child, because mm. being childish is what being a comedian is all about. But uh, I also find that. Um, 
you know, that if I was writing like Harvey, uh, bits are quite dense, densely written, and you know, because he's very distracted and obsessive, their sentences mm. are quite long. So I found it quite a relief to write Colette's bit. But also, I have uh, at the time she was eight, uh, a now nine-year-old daughter, and although she is, so not, you got her to write it. Well, well yeah, I got her to write it. <laughs> you know what? I did get her to read it, not did all you? of it, not and certainly not some of the other bits, but some of Colette's bits. I said, "Can you read this, Dolly? That's my daughter's oh, name, yeah. and can you tell me if you think it sounds like you or one of your friends?" And she, you know, she wouldn't read it all yeah. uh, but she did read some of it before she got a bit bored um, <laughs> and said and you know and i would listen to her but also i've got her voice in my head and colette is not like dolly in, in many different ways um but the tone in which she speaks it, it's partly because i find with kids now is i think they're much more articulate quicker than we were uh, not emotionally so and in fact i think this is an issue i think they're verbally articulate and linguistically articulate because they watch much more tv yeah. and they've got the internet and blah blah and more books but then they don't have the emotional capacity to deal with what they can verbalize which is partly again what colette is about it's being given adult information slightly too soon well if you'd like to ask jessica francis kane or david Badil a question um oh eight four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number to call you can text us on eight four eight five oh or email ian i a i n at lbc.co.uk or you can of course tweet us at lbc973 you're listening to the lbc book club with me are jessica francis kane the author of the report which is a novel about the bethnal green tube disaster in 1943 it's published by portobello books in paperback at 12.99 and david Badil's novel is called the death of eli gold it's published by fourth estate uh, 18.99 in hardback is it being published at the same time in paperback because no. publishers do weird things now with, with novels oh, well, don't I don't, they? I'm not aware just in hardback I think that would be a mistake wouldn't it because then people well, would just buy the paper they do, do oh, they? this is really weird well he's published of course in the same time electronic yeah, uh, which of course is cheaper, so that's uh, uh, an issue. But uh, no, I think paperback comes right. out in about nine months or something. Okay, well, it's it's um, well, it's a lot of paper here for eighteen ninety nine. No, well, I like, it is very good, very yeah. good value. Um, now, uh, Jessica, you're you're speaking at an event tomorrow. Do you just, just want to tell us what that is in case people might like to pop along. Yes, I'm speaking at the London Transport Museum uh, as part of the exhibit there this spring called Under Attack, um, which is an exhibit about London during the Blitz. And the curator of the museum will will speak first, I believe, uh, and he will speak about shelter use during the war and uh, and public transportation in general and how and how uh, important it was to morale that that the public transportation continued uh, during the Blitz and 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 then I will speak about uh, the book and the novel and my research and um, and read bits from it. And what, what time is that? That is at six thirty tomorrow. And is it ticketed or can anyone just? Turn it is up? ticketed. Yes, but you can buy tickets. You can in the buy door. tickets there. Yes, eight and pounds. Have I you think. been back to the? Bethnal Green, because you lived here 10 years ago. Yes. Have you been back sort of this trip? Yes, in fact, just um, yesterday, I went to St. John's for the memorial service for the survivors oh. and families of, of victims, right. which I believe is held every year in St. John's is Church, it? which is right stands right across from the entrance where the crush happened. Um, okay. My novel actually handles that, the, 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 the tragedy and irony of the fact that this this terrible crush happened in the shadow of a church, quite literally. Mm. Um, and before the shelter, before the tube station was used as a shelter, the crypt of St. John's was used. It was opened as a shelter before the government allowed the people to use the tube station as a shelter. There was, they were quite hesitant about that at first, at the beginning so, of the war. So when you go, when you go to the tube station, do, do you sort of feel a bit, I mean, it's, it sounds a bit odd to say do you feel emotional in a London underground station, but you can, un <laughs> having having researched it so much uh, and presumably getting to know a lot of the, the stories of the, the, of the people, that, the, of the families that died, I, it is it, quite emotional. It's very moving, it is, and, and you know, it, it, it makes me sad that there's just a small plaque there that com commemorates yeah. this accident, and... Um, there is a group called the Stairway to Heaven Memorial Trust that's been working for years to raise enough money to erect a permanent memorial at the site, and and they are about halfway there. And I, I wish them well. I hope that they will get their memorial eventually. Um, but it is very moving. I, I I thought the service yesterday was moving, and um and there there is a way in which I wonder, you know, why why me? Why this American mm. writer? We, you know, why why would I but be the one to write I this story? I also wonder. I mean, we were talking uh, just in the break there, David. And I, neither of us had known about this disaster, and yet, David, you've you've been you've lived in London. Virtually London all my life. life, and also I wrote a book uh, set during the war, uh, not during that part of the war, but 
Um, and I, I feel, and also, you know, my family are from the East End, you know, my uh, original uh, maternal, I know, my, my paternal family uh, settled in the East End really? in the, right. at the turn of the 20th century uh, when they came over from, from Russia. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I feel I should know about well, it. Well, it, 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 it really isn't well known, and I, th- I think... I think well, there are a couple that? of reasons. Well, it was suppressed initially. Um, it happened on March 3rd, and the government tried to suppress all news of it for several days, and did so quite successfully, um, largely because morale was so low at that point. They mm. felt if Londoners knew of this, they it would just make morale even worse. And, and also, consequently, if, if the enemy found out about it, it would boost their morale, because yeah. they would think, look at that, we have them so scared, they're crushing themselves. Well, also, the presumably, shelter. it might also leave people not to go into tube... Uh, uh, into tubes when they needed to. I, Pre- yes. Presumably the government were worried that if this got out, people might be frightened of going yes. into shelters. Well, that is true. And and they trusted the shelters. I mean, the mm. people loved these shelters. And and, um, and and it and to have a loss of faith in the shelters would have been devastating. So mm. I think that played into it as well. So is your book partly about the sort of culture of the shelters, about what life is. is like being in the shelters? It and is, stuff? and yeah. how they were used. And in the East End, where, where of course, many of the Jewish refugees had come and, and the... And the um, you know, by all accounts, it was a very successful community, and and uh, you know, refugee situations like that are always so difficult. But but there was a widespread sense that it was going well, and people were were doing well, and there were there were tensions, but everyone was was getting along. And yeah. and then when this happened, there were rumors flew. You know, they they thought it was fascist incitement. Yeah. They called it a Jewish panic. Of course. Um, yeah. And you know what? That so, rings a bell. <laughs> now that you've used that phrase, I think that rings a bell. And maybe I do know about this disaster. I mean, because that's interesting about the culture of the shelters. That's a really interesting subject. Cause, uh, in my previous book, there's a scene set in an Anderson shelter, which obviously is a private, oh, yes, that, a right, private the, shelter in yes, a house. And I wonder how exactly. many people thought, well, I'll, if there's a bomb, if there's a, a sirens go off, whether I'll be in my shelter in my garden, or whether or not there's a greater safety in numbers, and, and also more of an atmosphere, more joy, more I, life. Yes, I think tubes. so. Well, and I believe it was very... Um, there was a class difference. I mean, you couldn't, right. not everyone could afford a, a shelter in the home. You know, there right. was also the Morrison shelter, which was sort of a steel coffee table yes. kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, so these were the public shelters, and, and this was the East End, and, and, and they were, you know, this was a poorer class of people who were using these. And um, I'm not sure everyone, you know, had a choice about which shelter to use. Yeah. Um, well, really but I think the culture well. is fascinating. I mean, they were th- there was a library. There was a library in the shelter. Within the shelter. Within the shelter, there was a canteen. There was a right. there was a nursery. There was a, a theater. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they weren't all like this. Bethnal mm. Green was quite extraordinary, but but that is quite similar to what happened on the Isle of Man. See, in the Isle of Man, where German Jewish mainly refugees were interned, there was a university. Oh, so, because amazing. most of the people who got out of Germany were, of course, eminent, because the ordinary Jewish whatever chemist didn't get out. So if you got out, you tend to be sponsored. So it would be there were five Nobel Prize winners on the Isle of Man. The Amadeus Quartet amazing. met on the Isle of Man. Kurt Schwitters was on the Isle of Man. Sir Nicholas Pevsner, all these intellectuals. And uh, there's a quote in that book somewhere uh, that the centre of European intellectual and cultural life in 1941 was Douglas on the Isle of Man, which is a sort of incredible. <laughs> it's thing. incredible. Yeah. yeah. Let's explore the concepts of truth and blame, because I think they feature in both of, of your mm, books to, mm-hmm. to, to an extent. There's a wonderful quote um, in, in your book, Jessica. People think they want the whole truth, but they're far happier with only as much as they can forgive. Mm. Explain that. Yes. Well, that's the, that's the, um, that, is, that is a main idea of the, of the novel. And that, that is, uh, I believe, there. Well, you know, there are two figures in the book. There's the magistrate, Lawrence Dunn, the only historical character in the book, uh, trying to help the community after the tragedy b- by writing this report. And then there's the vicar of St. John's, who I imagine, uh, McNeely. And he, he's trying to help the community through, through faith. And both of them sort of feel that, that um, forgiveness is key um, to, to get past this incident, to not let the rumors take hold and not find a scapegoat goat um and and so they they in different ways they both feel that they believe that that um that that in this atmosphere it might be better to withhold some of the truth and and david do you think that there there are sometimes when um we actually can't cope with the whole truth and that sometimes when these inquiries come out it, it you can understand why sometimes we don't get it well i think that in any kind of big 
uh, situation, uh, a big sort of public situation, uh, what actually, the, the actual truth hardly ever emerges because there's always complexity involved and detail involved and people don't, don't really want to hear that mm. in a way. Um, and my book is partly also about the way that, that fame distorts that, that people have an idea of Eli um, and they have an idea of how he's lived his life and they have an idea, and Harvey, who's a ghostwriter, has to kind of manage those expectations. And I think if you live your life through a public lens, whether it's as a celebrity or a writer or indeed as a magistrate, then what your actual identity is and your actual, you know, doings in the world uh, become distorted because many people have a take on them and it's very Mm -hmm. hard to actually get through to what the truth is to any kind of objective truth with all that. And of course, when we have inquiries, and I mean, we've got the 7-7 inquest going on at the moment, we're always looking for someone to blame. Yes. And and I think that that is a facet of modern society in mm. a way that maybe wasn't so much there 40 50 60 years ago it's it's the first it is there's a it's a strong impulse it's immediate i think we all feel it um you you immediately want to know how did this happen who's to blame how mm. can we make sure it will never happen again and they're very compelling questions i just think the answers are are usually very complicated and don't come simply and um and, you know, I've been so interested following this, this, the uh, coroner's inquest into 7-7. And, and I noticed in the, in the press this weekend there was a call for the report now to be written in, in plain English, I believe it was said, you know, to be readable, to be compelling mm. so that it's actually read. Um, because I think so many of these, you know, we want answers to these questions. There's a need to know what happened. And then the report comes out many months later, sometimes many years later. And, and then, you know... It's it's a story that not everyone believes. It, it it tries to be the truth, but it isn't doesn't always. But it's, it's interesting that thing about blame because I mean I think that is indeed possibly sometimes a kind of vindictive or simplistic impulse. At the same time, you could say it's an, a, a progress because the fact that, you, that the this tragedy, the the Bethlehem Green tragedy, was to some extent covered up for many years, is to do with it came from a time uh, when the government decided for you. Uh, you know, similarly, the, one of the reasons that the government were able to in turn Jewish German refugees right. is they were suppressing information about the Holocaust because they basically felt that the British public shouldn't know about it because then they might start feeling, oh, this is a war that we're fighting on behalf of the Jews and all the rest of it. So the point, my point being that when tragedy strikes now, we do live in an obviously much more democratic age, so people want answers and they want them right away. Now, that might be bad. In some respects, it might be too quick, but at least you don't get a situation where some paternalistic figure decides right. you don't need to know what the real reasons were. Right, exactly. We're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, I, it's just not always... It, it, it just isn't always going to be the whole story obviously, at the time. Yeah. yeah. We mentioned the 7-7 inquest there, and um, regular listeners will know that LBC reporter Declan Harvey has been at the uh, inquest every single day and has been doing a daily blog reporting on the, on the station. And I'm going to give him a little plug now because he's just been voted the Young Journalist of the Year today. Oh, well, that's oh, so, well and very well deserved <laughs> it is too. So if you're listening, Declan, well done. Um, it's now quarter to ten. Time for travel with Alan Joyce. Thanks, Ian. An update on the tubes and the Bakerloo line is now... And you're listening to the LBC Book Club with me, Ian Dale. Jessica Francis Kane is with me, and David Badil is here too. Um, David, we've been talking about one or two of the characters in your novel, uh, which is called The Death of Eli Gold. Um, Harvey is a very interesting character, the, the, the son of Eli Gold, very mixed up. Do you think he's typical of a, a child of a famous parent? Um, well, I hope so. Um, I mean, I read a bit about those the people like that, um, mm. specifically about... Um, Adam Bello and about David Updike. Uh, David Updike, for example, John Updike is my favourite writer. Uh, I love John Updike, uh, even though, uh, you know, uh, I think that he too fits into this type of man whose sort of time perhaps has passed, but I really love his work. And David Updike was once asked, um, what was it like for you growing up when your dad was essentially writing novels about adultery that lots of people thought was probably about his adultery and Mm. whatever. And David Updike said, well, I guess uh, for dad, writing always came first. And and I I remember thinking, God, Mm. that is an incredible kind of admission in a way for a child to make, meaning I didn't come first. Um, And again, I think there's a time, there was a time before now when that would have been kind of 
not acceptable is the wrong word, but just taking for granted that a man who was that great a writer would not put his children first, in the same way mm. that Picasso, as a painter, needed to go off and find his next muse and would never stick with a, a woman he was with, you know, just because you have to be driven by art first and foremost. And I'm not sure that any of us kind of think like that anymore, and whether or not... And the, and the novel doesn't say it's a good or a bad thing that we don't. It just is dramatised at this point that I feel that, that it's changing. But, yeah, I, I mean, I hope that... You know, it isn't just at all. Harvey is screwed up in many, many different ways. And also, you know, he's, I hope, I think, where a lot of the comedy of the book comes from as well. Mm. Um, and he's constantly neurotic and complaining and angsty and whatever and deprived. He always thinks he's deprived in any kind of situation, uh, especially sexually. But um, he um, he is also, I think, trying to be a good man, trying to be a better man than, than he can be. And that comes partly from this huge weight of greatness that he feels behind I him. I don't know, the name Randolph Churchill comes into my mind. Yeah. In- in, in this, in, in well, a way, I, I mean, a very different character in many how, ways. I don't know, but him. But I mean, what must that actually be yeah, like to exactly. be the son of, of Winston Churchill? It must be very difficult to, to work in that shadow. But how's your daughter going to grow up? She'll be the fine. daughter of a great man. She'll well, be fine. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, you're writing and doing the school run, probably. I mean, I'm doing the school run exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, that's I mean, the new ideal. I, yeah. I, I made <laughs> a, I made a list earlier. I mean, I joke about that, but there is an element of seriousness in it. I mean, you've had a number one hit single twice. Mm. You've written best-selling novels. Mm. You've presented top-rated TV shows. You've you've starred in the biggest comedy gig ever in this country. You've written a movie screenplay. You've made documentaries. You've got a column in The Times, a column in Esquire. She's got quite a lot to live up to. I think Dolly will be fine. Uh, You know, uh, (laughs) she's an incredibly cool, talented kid uh, who's uh, much more sorted than I am, apart from anything. Um, And I, uh, I detect in her already a sort of calmness and and you know happiness with the world i so i think she'll be okay but who knows if she does obviously uh, have a terrible life then uh, i i i say now i'm blameless it's right not, it's okay, not my fault. okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll believe you um you described yourself earlier as a as a comedian do you still see yourself first and foremost as a comedian well i don't see myself as a stand-up anymore because although i do occasionally go drag my carcass onto the stage to make people laugh um i don't <laughs> do that much anymore and i think to be a proper comedian you have to be doing live mm. comedy um and i don't feel the urge to write those kind of observational gobbits anymore that i used to do all the time i want to write stories and i want to tell stories and that's really why i'm writing novels and films i mean stand-up comedy i guess is all about the instant fix isn't it the fix yeah. of creating laughter whereas writing a novel is almost the polar opposite well one thing i really love about comedy um and why you know this is a comic novel and i think my instincts even though i may not be a stand-up anymore are still towards comedy is because it is the only form in which you can get an absolute definite sense of response you know that i mean if you see a, a play that's a serious play who knows really how it's gone down critics will say one thing or whatever and mm. you know the audience may respond in one way or another but if it's a comedy and people are laughing then straightforwardly you know you've done your job <laughs> and i don't want to be luddite about this but there's something i love about that you know i think it's a, a great thing and i also think you know it's a cliche but whoever it was you said you know comedy uh, uh, dying is easy comedy is hard is absolutely true the downgrading of comedy the fact that there were no comedies for example in the oscars when loads and loads of apart from toy story 3 which was the best film but only one one silly little category <laughs> um, but you know, comedy is a very very hard thing technically to get right but he's not recognised in general in our culture as, as, as an important form. Um, you compared something called Stand Up to Stop Suicide. You've, I did. You've appeared on radio as publicising the issue yeah. of young male suicide. I partly bring that up I'm a patron of a charity called Calm, which is uh, about trying to stop uh, suicide in men uh, under 40, specifically, mm. which is the highest rate of suicide. Well, a friend of mine, age 34, killed himself last week. Okay, and the shock that. of that to, I mean, not just his, obviously his family were completely shocked, but to the shock to acquaintances, let alone friends, was, was absolutely massive. Yeah. And how, how did you first become involved in this? Well, I, the absolute truth is I was doing the school run, uh, as Jessica said earlier, <laughs> and the uh, woman uh, who runs, organises that charity is a mum at the school, and she came up to me and asked me, and my first thought was, I'm going to be perfectly honest here, was, well, if I say no to this, I will feel guilty every day mm. on the school run, <laughs> <laughs> because it's a very good a course. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm Jewish, it's enough. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So, and then I thought also, I think this is a very good thing to do, because um, I think that um, it's a, it's, she told me more about it. I didn't know, you know, just how prevalent it yeah. was as a problem um it's also calm is specifically about trying to get young men to talk about their 
problems because that seems to be the thing that happens is that young men are very, very unable or certainly working class young men are unable. They don't have any culture of talking about being depressed. They don't, a lot of them wouldn't even probably recognise depression mm. as something they suffer from. So calm is about simply trying to get those men as a switchboard. They have their own dedicated Samaritan-like people on that switchboard to help uh, these young men just talk a bit about it. Um, because it's a, it's a, you know, far, far, far more young men have killed themselves since the war in Iraq started than have died in Iraq. I mean, than British men. Really? Yeah, far more. It, it's um, a sort of subject that you don't talk about in polite society still. It's a bit, I mean, well, it is partly about mental illness, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, we don't like to talk about it. No, we don't. But, I mean, you know... It just seems to be that with problems in society, some of them are sort of fashionable and some of them rather aren't. And, you know, I, I, there's just odd reasons for that. But this is a very difficult subject, mm. which is partly, I, I guess, why I was interested. And also, you know, I've always been interested in my work in what masculinity is, you know, even from being a new lad to writing this book. You know, I'm interested in what it means to be male and, and, and to be sort of not a cardboard cutout of a man um and so i guess you know it just it interests me intellectually as well as emotionally and what's the next big project for you well i've got a film that i've written uh which is called romeo and Brittany, uh which <laughs> is uh about an, it's an american film it's about a, a, a young american high school girl who's desperate to pay juliet in her high school play but is too shy to audition and then bang she goes to a rabbit, to a rabbit hole and she is juliet in the real world of romeo and juliet and that's i'm supposed to i'm directing it and it's supposed to be filming in the summer you've written yeah. you've written i it. wrote that yeah with so the guy the co- you're directing it yeah i wrote it co-wrote it with the guy who produced the infidel which is the film that i had out last year Wow. Follow that, Jessica. What's uh, next for you? I know, gee. Um, <laughs> well. <laughs> I was going to come to you first. You kind of wish I had now, don't you? <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, I just sold another collection of short stories. My, my uh, first book was a collection of short stories published in the U.S. A- about eight years ago. And this is my first novel. And, um, and my U.S. publisher has just bought the second collection of short stories, which will come out next year. I love short stories. So I really I. think it's a form that we need to have more of. It's so much bigger in America as a form, but we don't do that much of it. Jeffrey yeah. Archer does. A- and actually, his are actually rather good. Oh, are they? They re- oh, really that are. That is yeah. an unusual sentence. No, I, 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 like, no, I'm glad I, know, I like Jeffrey <laughs> Original thinking. He was one of my first guests on the programme, so I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what do you get out of short stories? What do I get out of them? More, more instant fulfilment than you will out of a novel, I guess. Oh, well, yes. I, you, it's funny. Most of these were written actually during the same years I was working on the novel. Um, I, I was working on the novel in one way or another for about 10 years from the time I came across the idea to the time it came out. Um, although I did have two children along the way, so that slowed me down a bit. Um, but I wrote these stories, and and um, and some of them have been published, and some some have not, and they'll go into the collection. And but it is nice. It, I, I mean, I found the novel really a long slog, and and it was nice mm. to take a break and write uh, write a short story. Well, it's very good of you both to come in today. Um, you let me just repeat the details of your books: The Death of Eli Gold by David Baddiel is published by Fourth Estate, eighteen ninety nine in hardback. Uh, the Report by Jessica Francis Kane is twelve ninety nine Portobello Books in paperback. Now, coming up over the next few weeks on the book club you'll be able to hear from paddy ashdown uh, peter mandelson francis beckett stephanie powers fatima buto catherine mayer i mean it's a veritable collection isn't it it is coming oh, up I'm next coming up next is clive <laughs> bull this is lbc 97.3 looking for value service and a fantastic